to see uh, lots of familiar faces and some unfamiliar ones as well. Um, as, uh, as Ruth said, um, this is a, one of a, of a series of Zooms, so I hope you'll be tuning in uh, in the following weeks. We've got some interesting topics to tackle, but our topic for today is um, the question of how uh, a year of the COVID pandemic has affected religion in terms of attendance at services and, and in more general the membership and affiliation. Um, we've got a really cracking panel of, of guests I'm going to be speaking with. Um, we've got uh, David Vos, who's a sociologist, academic sociologist of religion with University College London, one of the leading uh, writers and, and researchers in this area. Uh, we are pleased to welcome back uh, Peter Linus, who's the UK director of the Evangelical Alliance um, here in the UK. We've also got uh, Kari Asim, who's a, an imam in Leeds and the chair of the Mosques and Imams National Advisory Board. And also uh, Tilak Parekh, who is a researcher and commentator on Hinduism in the UK. Um, this is an incredibly broad topic. I'm aware we can't cover everything, um, but I hope we'll have a, a great discussion. I'm going to speak to our, our guests uh, for the first half, and then I'll um, open up uh, to questions from, from the floor. Um, so please, if you have a question, feel free to drop it in the chat window um, or scribble it down somewhere and I'll, and I'll ask for questions if there hasn't any cropped up, but please do feel free to kind of comment along in the chat window as we go. Um, I wanted to start by coming to, to David. Um, you know, people I think will be quite familiar with the long term, well, maybe they won't, but with the long term trends around religious affiliation and membership in Britain. Um, is it too early to say whether the last 12 months or so has had any impact on those kind of macro trends? Are you aware of any evidence that's, that we can yet point to? I'm afraid it is too early. We can talk about uh, the different factors, pro and con, that might be impacting participation uh, in religious activity, uh, but which ones will prevail is a fascinating question that I suspect we won't know the answer to for a couple of years. Um, I mean, very briefly, on the one hand, there's the point of view that the calamity will bring people back to religion and the hope of finding community and consolation. Uh, on the other hand, it's possible that this great disruption will have a long-term impact that's negative. Um, church going is largely a matter of habit. For some people, those habits won't be fully restored uh, and there are various other issues as well. I, I'm happy to talk at more length about uh, both those factors, but that's a very quick answer to your question. Mm, thank you. I wonder if I can quickly go around our panel and, and talk to them about their own specific context. Let's let's come to um, to Kari first. Um, speaking about the the British Muslim community, this is obviously a very broad question. But in your experience, do you think the pandemic has has prompted more people to come to mosques? and attend other forms of, of Muslim services, whether online or in person, or as it caused fewer people to attend than might have previously. Afternoon, and Tim, first I'd like to thank the Religion Media Centre for organising this webinar. I think it's really important that we uh, learn some lessons and also reflect on what has happened in the last 12 or so months. Um, so from Muslim's perspective, um, people of faith will often say that at times of crisis, people turn to God. And it was really unusual that obviously the, the houses of God were actually closed to the public. So we had this dichotomic situation, a dichotomy in the situation that effectively people, we did find people were turning to God. And uh, so people were more spiritual, but perhaps they were not able to express their religious practices in the houses of God. Uh, and so, you know, places of worship, or faith leaders, including mosques and imams, they turned online, provided religious, spiritual guidance online, as well as pastoral care. Uh, and so we, but we had a mixed bag because young people were more tuned in online. So uh, like when my congregation, usually a Friday will be uh, over a thousand people coming to the mosque, but actually uh, I was doing it online all by myself. It was quite surreal, just sitting in a mosque, you know, in front of a screen and and uh, talking to the screen. And but a thousand people were tuned in, but not necessarily my usual congregation. So that was an interesting thing. People were tuned in from you know, Bedfordshire, from you know, from across the across the country, rather than my local congregation. So we didn't, you know, uh, lose congregation, uh, if we may say so. But it was a different type of congregation. Uh, and what we found that uh, you know elderly 
members of the community, they were not able to join in online. And so interestingly, some mosques, you know, lots of mosques around the country, they, they, they um, installed radio transmitters into the mosque and then people had the radio transmission in their houses. So lots of different things happened. But overall, I'll say it's too early to say whether we lost congregation or we gained a different type of congregation, but time will tell. Thank you, Karen. I wonder if I could turn to Peter now. I don't know whether the, the EA, the Evangelical Alliance, um, has, has any kind of data to hand on this. Do you have any sense in which whether there's been, um, I'm sure there's obviously, you know, small move, but overall, has there been an increase or a decrease in, in people coming to services? Um. So without sounding too Irish as I am, uh, yes, both. <laughs> uh, and I say that because of different categories. I think the evidence seems to suggest there has been an increase in newcomers. And uh, I think similar to what uh, Carrick was saying, uh, younger people, so a younger audience and also a male audience. Uh, as somebody once said, there's never been an easier time to sneak in the back door of church. So in many other environments, we'll go and search something out. If we're going to book a hotel or look at something, we go online and look at it. That wasn't often possible at church. And now in this season, it has been so nearly all churches went online. Um, and so actually lots of people have found that easier to do. And so we've seen some uptick. But at the same time, I think it would be naive and, and wrong to say there hasn't also been uh, some other negative consequences. We know, for example, that children's ministry is, has proven extremely difficult for churches. So there's been a, a significant break for many. Now, lots have done creative things. But overall, we found, I think, 35 percent of churches in response to survey we did weren't doing kids work either in person or online. That, that's a big chunk and over a long period of time, as David was saying at the start, habits change and are broken or aren't created in the same way. And given the influence of the early years and people coming to faith, that would be a, a factor. And we know there's some financial challenges, perhaps not on the scale that people anticipated, but inevitably for many people, that's, that's a factor. But so we did two, two different surveys. What we know from 900 church leaders responding in June was they were saying, more people coming who didn't normally attend church, more people making commitments and engaging. Um, and so more people overall were going to church. We do know people were attending multiple services. And we do know some data from the States is also saying though there is a fatigue with kind of Zoom church. It's not, I don't think as clear in the UK, um, but in the States they were saying perhaps a third of practicing Christians no longer checking in. And the final thing I'll say is the, the, the most recent YouGov one I could see in November was sort of saying, look, 5% had found faith and seeing it grow, 4% were seeing it go down. That's why I'm saying both. The net effect might not be a huge change, but there are new people have definitely engaged, but there are some, possibly more nominal, um, uh, who have changed. And I suspect overall habits will change. So the weekly attendance might go to from four or five times a month down to three times a month. And those are the things we simply don't know yet. Thanks, Peter. Um, what about uh, Attilak? From, from the, the Hindu perspective, from what you're seeing, has the, the pandemic and the associated kind of closure of, of Hindu temples had a significant impact on, on attendance and affiliation that you've seen? Um, based off the, so the, the temples that I'm researching, in particular, there's one called the Nizan Temple, and they webcast different religious ceremonies, rituals, and assemblies. And I've been keeping track of the YouTube view accounts um because the youtube provides viewers like how many viewers are watching live at any at any point and the viewers do seem to mean to their thousands which would not normally happen uh if the congregations were in person so while it does appear to be the case that um there are thousands of people viewing that does not necessarily also mean that the congregation numbers have increased because one particular consideration here is that Streaming online means it's open to anyone and everyone across the world. So someone in India could be watching the ceremonies taking place here. Someone in Australia could be watching the ceremonies, which does not necessarily mean just because view accounts are going up or view accounts shows you know, thousands of viewers that congregation numbers are increasing. Um, so I think that's one thing. The second thing is that I've um, I think in previous uh, Zoom calls uh, in, for, for, the, for the Religious Media Center and, and um, some articles I've read online, I've been hearing that there's been perhaps an increase, and even uh, now, that young people seem to be tuning in more um, because uh, of the pandemic. Now, whilst at the start of the pandemic, uh, through some interviews I conducted, I felt that was the case. But recently, I seem to think that was short-lived. Um, 
it seemed to be this this is from my perspective and from the people I've interviewed and, and, and some Hindus, young people that I've been in touch with, it seems to be the case that whilst at the time it was new, uh, you know, online streaming and you know, rituals being streamed online and online discussion groups, and it was new, it was the in thing. Um during the early months of the pandemic when these online measures were introduced. So it did seem to be the case that young people, uh, at least the young people in the Hindu community that I've been uh, researching were more inclined or, or, or the congregation numbers were increasing in that sense. But um, over the last month, uh, it seems to be the case that there's been to be online fatigue in a way that, um, you know, we've had enough of it and um, it's, it seems to be the case that the optimism or, or, or the, what, what, what commentators were saying at the time about young people engaging, it seems to be the case that I don't think that's sustained. So I, um, I agree with um, what, what David said really that uh, at the start, that I think it's, um, it's too early to call um, right now. Thank you. I want to come back to you, David. I saw you nodding your head along with something what Tilak was saying there. Yes, well, I think uh, everyone has uh, highlighted this issue of youth, and it, it really is a critical one, I think. I mean, I go on about this a lot in my own work, but religious decline in the Western world has been largely generational. That is to say, it's not a matter of adults suddenly deciding in midlife that they're not really interested. It's about young people not replacing their parents or grandparents uh, in religious organizations. So it's simply that people are not entering at the lower end. And so the uh, age profile of uh, the religious community gets older and older and people die out. Anyway, um, that means that getting young people involved is critical for religious communities. And a huge question in the pandemic is what will be the impact on youth. Now, I, I think the opportunities for experimentation and investigation are very important. And of course, young people are digital natives. And so it's never been a better time to go out and look at the opportunities uh, that are out there. And indeed, of course, to do things in a relatively casual way. So you can uh, dip into services without actually needing to be concerned that uh, you'll be called on to do something you don't want to do. Uh, that said, there does seem to me to be clear evidence that teenagers, for example, are not all that excited at the prospects of having some kind of church youth group online. Um, it's one thing to get together with your friends and have free food and be able to chat and do some activities that uh, basically just are you and your mates. It's another to be on a Zoom call where there's constant adult surveillance when you know we're all kind of Zoomed out anyway. Um, and I, I think there's been a real drop off in youth participation in ordinary religious activities that I'm familiar with, but I'm very open to the possibility that that isn't the case elsewhere. And, you know, one of the features of the current situation is that there's been tremendous experimentation and innovation uh, across religious organizations. And it may well be that some have been more successful in maintaining youth interest than others. Thanks. Mm. Thank you. Uh, Peter, I wanted to come to, come to you next, because you, you, you mentioned that yourself, that you, you were concerned or there were concerns around the difficulties in putting on things like youth groups and children's work. Do you think you and your member churches have fears that, you know, if you don't, if you miss, there's a generation of kids who are being missed out and who would have used this year to kind of be introduced to Christianity and that, and that might not filter through for 10 years, but it will have an impact down the line. Yeah, I mean, I, speaking as a parent, I'm aware of that, uh, you know, so uh, the 35% who can't run either online or in-person children's services, that's that's going to be a challenge for sure. I think that the children is the is one of the most challenging aspects of this, just to respect the bubbles and what's going on in schools. Uh, I think, so I want to distinguish maybe the two. Our survey in September time that Evangelical Alliance ran had a thousand people responding, um, church attenders, and we saw a, just a fractional increase from seven and a half uh, engagements amongst services or engagements, including small groups, 
just up to eight. And actually the bracket that was most engaged were that 18 to 24 year old. Now it was only just marginally ahead of any other group. Um, and they were more likely to have checked into church um, than uh, in the online season than before. Now it's a self-selecting survey. It's a thousand people. It's, it's not, uh, you know, it's small, but not insignificant. Um, we're not saying that, but that also tallies with the, the piece of times around, I think the 28th of December there, based on YouGov, Gen Z are more likely to engage the millennials. Again, small shifts, but these aren't, uh, I think they're worth noting. So I do have concerns about the kids piece. I think the millennials, and sorry, the Gen Zers, that younger piece is probably more interesting. It's much easier to come in online. I think kids are struggling in the online environment, children's ministry in particular. And speaking to children's agencies, they're definitely finding that harder much of the work engages around schools and if schools aren't meeting or aren't allowing outside agencies in in the same way that is undoubtedly a challenge not necessarily insurmountable but it's a significant habit breaking period nine months to a year it's going to have a consequence and we don't know all that that will mean mm. uh, Kari you mentioned as well that young people have been find it easier maybe to engage through their phones and we know that the, the Muslim population in Britain skews younger than average as well. How do you think the youth question features in, in, in your experience in the Muslim community here? Have they been drifting away or have they been more plugged in than maybe their less tech literate um, parents and grandparents? Yeah, I think they are more plugged in, in in some ways in the sense that it's easily accessible to them. But uh, in terms of whether that excitement or engagement is sustainable or not uh, and whether when they are tuning in from one session to another whether there is any continuity or it's just again flavor of what's, what's out there if you like and and even that has dwindled um you know as as we've gone deeper into the pandemic um what we've seen in terms of the religious education element uh, that has increased online uh, because institutions have also realized that effectively before they were catering locally but now they can they can get you know students from across the across the country and and so that you know a lot of faith institutions have invested in online teaching uh, and seems to be doing well in, with some institutions, others are still struggling. Uh, but what we are struggling with is effectively this um, um, uh, engagement level outside the education, because education is in some ways easier just to deliver sessions online in terms of people just coming together, uh, getting involved in, in some you know, local work. So what we did see in the first lockdown up to, uh, I'll say, you know, during the summer as well, and I think that's picking up again, is, is getting uh, people involved in, in some local activities like food bank to, you know, when, the, when, when, when sports activities were involved, some, some mosques did get involved in those again. So the, 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 there is a very scattered picture around the country. Uh, I think it all depends on the resources that a particular institution is able to invest uh, to be innovative and engaging with its, its, its audience. Hmm. Thank you. One of the things I'm really interested to talk about is, is whether the pandemic has caused a kind of spike in religiosity. So beyond simple attendance on, on weekly or midweek services, <clears throat> is there been an increase in interest in things spiritual? As some people have already mentioned, there was kind of some a scattering of anecdotal evidence at the start of the pandemic, you know, spikes in the number of Google searches for the words prayer and God. And, and people were saying, I think some Bible publishers said their sales had gone up. Have any of our panel, I'm um, open this to all of you, have any of you seen any kind of evidence that that was a lasting shift or was that just kind of a, a brief fizzle of intensity and excitement with the adrenaline and the anxieties around the, the beginning of this crisis? Maybe I can just make a comment about this factor in general. You know, it's widely believed that times of crisis uh, leads to renewed religious and spiritual energy. But when you actually look at the data on the impact of, for example, the world wars or the Great Depression or the Great Recession following the financial crisis, it's very, very difficult to find evidence of a lasting positive impact on religious activity. So I must say I remain skeptical, despite, as you say, the small scale evidence about uh, upticks in spirituality. Thanks. I think there's one point about um, those who are already religious, their religiosity is turning into a more full-time religiosity in the sense that where previously they would have to attend the temple to, to you know, for rituals or, or ceremonies. Now those rituals or ceremonies are entering their homes. 
um, and into a much more full time in terms of, you know, every, online there are continuously things being streamed um, from various Hindu temples across the world. So their religiosity is turning no longer into a part time thing where, you know, going to the temple uh, on an evening or on a weekend, but instead engaging in these rituals uh, full time, which is also in, in a sense, I think also creating intergenerational conflict in some sense, I think as well, whereby parents in certain households would want to tune into ceremonies on the TV, whereas the children want to watch the football game. Um, so I think we see now, whereas before uh, religion was kept sometimes separate from the domestic space where people would could, could go to places of worship, now religion is entering into domestic spaces, which can also sometimes lead to uh, to conflict in, in households. Do we think that maybe what we might see the pandemic have is that there's a, it's almost like an intensifying of the kind of long-term trends. And so you might see some of the more nominal um, kind of cultural believers drift away because they lose the habit of attending a service. Whereas those who are already kind of more predisposed to be religious have now, as you were saying to like a greater opportunity and so you have an intensifying and almost a concentrating effect where the small numbers of religious people um, maybe get smaller numerically, but more vibrant, more dynamic, more kind of fervent. I'm happy to come in there just to say, yes, I think so. One of the things I'd written in my own notes is I do think nominalism will uh, struggle in this season. The habits have been broken. So if this is not a deep conviction, uh, if this is this kind of cultural Christianity in our case, but cultural religion, I do, wonder how that that will survive or come through this and yet at the same time th this is why i think the initial trends might not show much you get that five percent up four percent down and a leveling out i have no idea what the overall will be but i think we'll have to pick behind those to find there's actually been an increase in certain areas um, and and even on the longevity point i know something like the alpha course has found this accessibility has seen significant numbers of people engaging online in a way that they probably wouldn't in person had that faded, I spoke to a leader this morning who not related to this call said they'd 40 signed up. And I could just tell, he said, I'm really surprised. I was not expecting that. They had had much smaller numbers previously. So even at this late stage, different stage of the pandemic, those numbers seem to be high, but almost certainly at the same time, there is a death of some form of nominalism happening. And that again, will be a challenge for churches as they come out of that, probably particularly the C of E. Um, just because of the cultural nature of, of the UK. Uh, and I know in discussions with them, they've said that they're going to be challenged to keep a number of churches running in certain areas. They're going to have to reassess slightly differently, perhaps. Mm. David. Andrew Brown has uh, raised an interesting question about the implications of the push online and whether this will uh, be particularly beneficial to bad religion as opposed to good religion. It, I think there is evidence, and this has been mentioned before, that um, there's something of an uptick in alternative spirituality, or at least people having the time on their hands to look into uh, different forms of perhaps alternative beliefs and uh, domestic practices. And we know, uh, of course, that conspiracy theory as well has uh, received a boost from this sort of move. Uh, the conjunction of the two that in the past I labeled conspirituality uh, is very much in evidence. Now, whether this will be an enduring phenomenon or just one of those things that uh, comes along in waves and then uh, goes again, I don't know, it's hard to say. It's a, a strange world and one that has certainly uh, pushed people to the web for information and um, interactions with others who are leading to them to beliefs that they might not have held otherwise. Um, and then we'll just have to see what the persistence or otherwise is. Mm. Um, Kari, I think you wanted to come in as well. Yeah, thank you. I was just going to come in to um, mention a couple of points on Tillich's point first, which was about that we saw more religiosity in, in domestic environments. So where 
where parents were perhaps going to places of worship before and the children were going to perhaps different types of services. What we saw that there was people were praying together. So there was an, an event of bonding as well. And I guess people weren't able to go anywhere in the first lockdown. So therefore there was more uh, no, uh, praying together and attending online services together. Now the, the impact of that was that people even when the lockdown eased, um, some of the younger people were not coming back to places of worship. And I think that's, that's one of the things that concerns the Muslim community, whether some people, have, you know, especially the younger generation, have got out of the habit and therefore they, they found their spirituality and religiosity elsewhere than their local places of worship. And as a result, whether that will have a huge impact on uh, the local places of worship, you know, to, local to, to those people. And the second point in terms of, I think the other concern is that perhaps from the radicalization perspective and bad you know, religion has been mentioned, that we, we, we are aware that a lot of perhaps brainwashing manipulation radicalization takes place online and and again so, so it, it provides a free space to those people who are perhaps preying on such young impressionable individuals to to uh, to brainwash them to manipulate their thinking uh, and their in terms of uh, implanting their ideology in the minds of these young people as to what the religion is so that's another impact that we will see um, another another aspect that we will you know, we'll keep, need to keep monitoring in the next few months and years. Mm. I wanted to ask David something. It's come up a lot. This question of habit. What's the evidence? What's the academic literature to say about the importance of habit and routine in people's religious at attendance and affiliation? I think it's extraordinarily important. Though of course it depends on the individual and perhaps the religious group. Um, I suspect that the main uh, Christian denominations are more, more vulnerable to this than perhaps the minority religious groups or for that matter, evangelical churches. Uh, but for large numbers of relatively casual Anglicans, Catholics, Methodists, etc., cetera, um, habit plays a huge part in uh, making church going just something that you do. And so long as that's the case and you're not questioning week to week, should I go, then you'll continue to go. But um, this disruption caused by COVID does two things, I think. One is that it leads potentially to behavioral drift. So just in the way that you might uh, have been going to the gym every few days or every week and you're a faithful attender, if that stops, you might still think of yourself as a gym goer uh, or a sports club member, but at a certain point, uh, it is really no longer the case in practice that you are uh, an attender. Uh, you might retain the identity without the practice. But the other thing that happens is that, so that's the sort of passive behavioral drift side, uh, but more actively, the interruption gives people, in a sense, an excuse to stop doing something that maybe they were never terribly committed to previously. So I think for both of those reasons, there is some reason to suppose, as Peter was mentioning, that uh, this could lead to real attrition amongst the more nominal uh, participants in religious organizations. Thank you. I wanted to come to a question we've had from Dave, Dave Perfect in the chat, um, who's asking about uh, the best ways to measure the measure attendance, which is much more straightforward done face to face, whereas how can it be meaningfully done for online services? And you read this a lot. There's concerns that the kind of the impressive numbers some people were having, as Tillet mentioned earlier, you might see a thousand, two thousand on your on your view counter. But what does that really mean? For example, on Facebook, I think you only have to watch three seconds. Of a stream for it to for your number to be added. Does anyone have any thoughts on on if if there is if there is any kind of meaningful way we can measure online attendance or at least get a sense of you know a thousand people in a building on a Sunday morning? How what does that correspond to? What is that equivalent to on an online service? I can comment to say I think it's a great question and very difficult. As somebody who was speaking recently and exactly that, our church would have had an attendance of a thousand people. So a thousand go on YouTube, a thousand plus end up on Facebook, a few hundred on a podcast, and none of us have the faintest idea what that really means in terms of levels of engagement. 
Now, what we then did as a survey, so that, that's just the honest truth. I totally agree with the question. The irony is in the, in the digital age, it seems to me it's harder to work out. <laughs> the old bums on seats, you could do the count as somebody used to do that as, a, as a, an executive pastor. Um, but what we then did with, with EA, it was a survey both of leaders in the first round, but the second round in September, we did leaders and church attenders on a number of questions to say, okay, leaders, what are you saying? Not that we don't trust you, but we also want to then ask your attenders. Now, again, self-select, I'm not saying, but and it's within the evangelical constituency, what's your levels of attendance like? So the, the things that encouraged us in that were something like small group, because again, it's not just Sunday attendance. So the numbers there, we asked them were they attending before and since, and we're trying to build the panel. There was only the small, a couple of percentage drop in that. So rates in those kind of areas stayed the same. And that's more interesting to me. And I think for a lot of church leaders, uh, the, where the secondary are they coming to the food bank and helping if they can are they going to a small group the Sunday attendance is so uh, there's so many variables I, I think very few take it as a robust number or only compare it to their previous numbers and, and are seeing if they're getting engagement many run live chat and have welcomers so the larger ones with the people on Facebook welcome you as you come in engaging with people trying to replicate that kind of dialogue and will pay a lot more attention in their feedback to that than they will to the kind of view numbers because they're so difficult to really track. I think uh, alongside the quantity of engagement, there's also the matter of quality of engagement, whereby when tuning into services and, think, uh, and, and ceremonies and sermons online, it can be very passive, whereby and the level of sensory stimulation is also not as much. Whereas previously, you know, people will be sitting on, you know, in the carpets of, of a temple or, or on the marble floor of a temple uh, with, with de images of deities and, you know, with everyone, you know, hundreds of thousands of people around them. Here, people are sat in joggers on a sofa in front of a TV screen with their phones or while cooking dinner. So the level of attention, how passive and active viewers are in engagement is also something which is seriously affected by, by digital worship. So I think um, alongside the quantity of, of the numbers, the view accounts, the quality of engagement uh, is also something uh, that will have to be looked into. Hmm. Yes, let me just second that. I think Jalak is absolutely on the mark there. I, I've done some very informal qualitative research, not to say anecdotal <laughs> collection and I, the issue, in a sense, um, to address Dave's question is, what's the alternative? You know, if the alternative was somebody not participating at all, whereas now they're kind of uh, curious and go online and attend a service, then that's clearly in religious terms a boost. You know, they would otherwise have been doing something entirely unreligious, and now they're doing however casually uh, some kind of religious exploration. So that's a positive. On the negative side, uh, a lot of actively religious people are in precisely the situation that you like describes. And whereas before, you know, people have said to me, look, I go to church, I'm sitting there in the congregation, I have no choice but to focus on the talks and the spiritual input and to reflect and so on. And it's a kind of immersive experience uh, in this tradition. Whereas with the best will in the world, you're at home and you're using the time to multitask, chopping vegetables, uh, looking at your phone, whatever. It's just not the same experience. Um, now, to come back to a point that Peter made, I think where the online move has clearly been helpful is precisely in the sort of parachurch or uh, the experiences outside the main worship services. Because there, if you think about all of the midweek activities uh, going on in the evening, for example, it's much easier to get to online than it would have been in the past where parents would have needed to get babysitters or uh, physically go somewhere. So uh, I think it does make sense that uh, Zoom can be beneficial for some of those uh, activities. And indeed, I would imagine that uh, those would potentially persist once the pandemic passes. Hmm. I wonder whether 
the 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 real change we'll see from this kind of COVID era will not necessarily be in the numbers of people attending services in total, but how they are distributed. Because I, I know there was signs early on, particularly that the larger, the more nationally famous, the well-funded, the very digitally literate places of worship were able to draw huge numbers to their live streams. And lots of them wouldn't be kind of like non-believers tuning in, but would be people who normally attend a much smaller congregation elsewhere, deciding to, to go to their effectively their cathedral or their kind of mega mosque or whatever it is. Do we think that would be a long term trend where people will gradually switch away, having been introduced to and, and you'll have a agglomeration effect where the largest places of worship um, will, will suck up uh, all the people who were previously sustaining a much broader network of smaller places of worship? The others are probably better qualified to speak on this than I am, but uh, let me just make a comment here. On the one hand, I can certainly see the possibility that, that will be the case, because clearly the HTBs of this world, um, the very large um, religious centers, are just better equipped and have more experience in putting on a great worship service and, and sundry activities. That said, Religion ultimately is about community. And I think unless you have community and in-person contact, uh, it's very difficult for it to survive. So I think that has to be something that happens uh, locally and ultimately at least occasionally in person. Um, you know, maybe for people who are already involved, uh, they will continue for some time to be satisfied with online services, but I, I don't think that alone uh, can recruit the next generation and keep people involved indefinitely. Yeah, I would agree uh, and follow on from what David was saying. It depends on what church is. So if church is simply uh, taking church in our, in our case, you know, uh, a preaching experience, some sort of communication and some sort of sung worship, if that's it, then there's no doubt the cathedrals, the HTBs, and others can do that better. It is actually, it's incredibly expensive to do that well in this season. It's a multi-camera, multi-digital setup, um, and it's incredibly time-consuming. And in one sense, we've seen that people have offered a singular service as an option in this season because of the capacity that it takes. But I don't think that's what church is. Um, and I agree with David, the, the community nature, the embodied nature, something like the Eucharist or communion in the Christian context, the debates and discussions around that, that is one of the key embodied moments when we take bread and we take wine, we do it together. It's a physical act. And uh, so that is one that will draw us together and saying, actually, yes, there's the possibility of continuing to access great preaching and great worship in a central form. But church is so much more that it has to be a gathering of people locally. We run local engagement for kids, for youth, for food banks. It's about meeting one another, blessing one another, encouraging one another and going back out into the world. And some of that has to be embodied. And also there'd be no pathways in that case for you, people to learn to speak and communicate the word, to worship, to engage, to learn around music and song worship and so many ways in which they serve in a church. All of that would be lost. So I think most ministers that we're speaking to are certainly alert to that problem. If this season goes on very long, you lose a whole series of people coming up through in that. Um, but the embodied experience is seen as absolutely critical. And I suspect initially we'll get that probably ramping up, if anything, because people have been so isolated, so lonely. We realize we're not great at being individuals. We're not great at living in a secular age. We're not great at processing death alone. These are horrible experiences. And ministers will tell you that some of the worst things is running funerals and engaging in those moments that we are not as human beings who might be wired to do that well on our own. We need that in community. And so I think there will be an uptick as we return because people want that. And then churches will have to navigate that moment well to try and continue that. There's an embodied nature to human life, uh, to our theology that I think is incredibly important. But we, the church, have been forced to think better about that. We've probably fallen into a consumer trap, I would say. We've offered the individual consumerist product, certainly in the Christian church, I would say, in some of our constituency. And this pandemic has forced us to reassess that. And I hopefully that's a good thing out of this. Yeah, I think I, I, I would agree there as well, that the embodied experience is, is, is essential um, for, for, for religions to operate and survive. But I think I'm trying to think of a comparison here between people being put on furlough and then the companies realize that you don't necessarily need them. So then they're made, people are made redundant. 
in a similar way with religious services, people haven't been going to temples and attending service, so they feel like they're on furlough maybe. And then they think, okay, I, I don't really need to go anymore. So when lockdown, when life returns back to normal, it would be interesting to see whether people continue going uh, to places of worship. And I think that is a big question on, on everyone's minds, really, as to how it's going to affect um, the future of, of, of attendance in, in places of worship. Because now all of a sudden people have realised that they may not need religion anymore. They may not need to go to a place of worship where previously they would attend weekly or daily. The sudden break might have dawned something upon them. Equally, we might see people missing it and then suddenly flock to, to places of worship. But it remains to be seen what, what, what happens. I mean, drawn on what Taleb just said, actually, I was looking into some of the stats around uh, kind of, I guess, the, the non-religious. And there's been a growing rise. It was one survey I saw, um, which is asking the question, do you believe in God or any other kind of higher spiritual power? Yes, no. Um, and that there has been a steady increase in those um, who, who, who don't believe in God or any higher spiritual power over the past decade. It was 29% in 2012 and it was up to 40 percent by January this year but then that the pollsters asked the same question again um in November so you know eight nine months into the crisis um and it doesn't seem to have shifted I wonder if our guests have any thoughts on whether secularism and, and atheism and non-religiosity will be impacted negatively or positively by by the pandemic personally I don't think so um you know, there's a kind of lay view of secularization that it's all about belief and um, things happen in science or society and people either stop believing or potentially they believe more. I don't really buy it. I, I think that religion is much more a social activity and the explanations behind uh, involvement are generally to do with social factors. So what we're looking at is a very long-term effect um, of the, the pandemic and whether people continue to participate to the same extent and in the same way and how that will impact not even so much them as the next generation. Uh, this is something that happens very, very slowly. So uh, Aaron, that's my own view, but I, I don't particularly think either that there's a big short-term impact in uh, searching for God or conversely, the problem of evil, uh, thinking how can there be a God in a world that's uh, suffering in this way? We've got, a, we've got an interesting one that's come in from Christopher Jameson, who, who is asking something I think is quite interesting. What will be the impact on the theology of our faith communities. I mean, Peter's already talked about reevaluating embodiment. Um, how does this work through in different faith theologies? Do we think different faiths and different theological traditions are, have been better suited to cope with the crisis? Um, have we seen evidence that, you know, religion can't be treated as this big block? It's obviously a group of very, very disparate traditions and, and communities. It's obviously had, have had huge impact on theology. And I think we had to, go back to our roots to to find meaning to it because when, when people are in crisis when there's pandemic or wars or conflicts um people are people ask you know questions such as where is god you know why are we going through this um such a difficult period of time and so it it, it, it theology also provided support for for muslim faith in the sense that we found some precedent in terms of how the prophet had told us to deal with such pandemics and things like that and that kind of you know re reassured people of their faith and so had a positive impact on those who were already religious and perhaps some who were you know um, flirting with the idea of religion but at the same time I, I, you know I can't say that actually it has had a huge impact on everyone and everyone became more religious because 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 of whatever was presented to them. Uh, and that that's the thing across the board in terms of what we were talking about earlier as well. The people who found people who were already religious, perhaps their faith deepened, but they also looked at different ways of engaging with their faith, not necessarily with their faith institutions, but they were 
there's a whole host of generation possibly that's become less connected to faith institutions. And I think the faith leadership has to really think how can they make their faith relevant? Because we often talk about atheism and secularism or militant secularism and how it's impacting on our faiths. But also perhaps one of the questions that we need to reflect on is how can faith leadership make faith relevant in the post COVID era? Uh, and and that's, that's a key question for us to reflect on. I just agree and would follow on from that. I think absolutely. I mean, if, if churches or religious bodies don't reevaluate embodiment and their theology, people just say simply, why would I turn up? At best, I'll tune in online. Tell me, you know, what's the difference? Is there a difference? Uh, and I think many of us want to say, yes, there is. Uh, when we can, we should be. But now we need to explain why. So why are we saying bodies are important? And that's a theological piece of work that I think uh, Christians and evangelicals in particular haven't been great at. We've focused on the saving of souls, that kind of language. It's about going to heaven when you die and that, and it has not been good at the embodied now and saying actually it's about reaching people in the here and now. It's about engaging this world. Our work is important. Creation care is important. Um, engaging in local communities. And we've seen a huge emphasis on the local in this season. Um, so people don't travel in the same way. I'm sitting on the North coast of Northern Ireland, fulfilling a UK role for our organization. Uh, but much more collected, connected to the local in this season. And so again, things like communion will go back to say, well, what can we do locally? How do we run that? And the two big issues church leaders said that are coming down the tracks are mental health um, and employment sort of finance issues, both of which have a very strong local aspect. So if churches are going to engage, religious bodies are going to engage, those are the kind of issues they need to tackle. And those are very local. You don't do that through an online Zoom service generally. So I do think that'll force some good, healthy reassessment uh, but actually, I think theologically, we're well equipped to do that. It's right. We probably slipped away. And this is a good pushback to do embodied better. I think the critic, a critical element here is religious leaders and leadership, whereby we see these innovations in, in religious practice and ritual. And we see how theology is being reinterpreted um, to fit with current times. And that is really where religious leaders seem to be clearly responsible and leading the inventions and innovations taking place, whereby we see change happening, but there are agents behind that change. And those agents are the religious leaders. Things which would have seemed absurd to do a year ago. You know, if, if you were to suggest to conduct a death ritual online with the priests or the monk or the Hindu, Hindu sadhus conducting a, over Zoom or something else like that, or or, or not conducting fasts to, to, to help immunity. If something like that would, was to be suggested a year ago, it would have been bizarre and absurd for followers. But now, because of the current climate and because religious leaders are validating, sanctioning these things, it suddenly becomes so easily accepted. So for many believers, their trust is in the religious authorities and leaders. If they were to say something that, okay, we've read, we've read the scriptures and, and there's, there's an injunction for this, or we can allow this, then all of a sudden there's an acceptance within the communities. So I think religious leaders play a critical role in, in developing, redeveloping, redefining the theological and, and ritual texts to fit with current modern climate and, of course, the, the pandemic we, we see ourselves in. Hmm. I wanted to come to um, Andrew Brown, who had another interesting question to ask. Um, the other sector of the economy and indeed of social life that has been really crushed by this uh, vaccine and the lockdown and so on, and pubs, of course. And I was wondering, does the team think that pubs or churches will recover best? And I want to come in on that one. Who will survive the COVID recession better, the local place of worship or the local boozer? The pubs are certainly going to struggle much more to get through financially to the other side. Uh, but having done so, I think it's precisely that order of aggregation where the in-person meeting is most important. And this is a sort of indirect answer to Andrew's question, maybe even slightly off topic, but uh, it relates to a, a query in the chat from the Religion Media Center. Um, what is it that we can take away as positives from the pandemic. Well, I think Zoom type calls are actually very effective for very small meetings and very large ones. So if you just spontaneously want to get together with a few people who might be scattered around the place, 
I, it's very helpful to have a video conference without having to assemble everybody in the same place. And likewise, if you're doing some big lecture or talking head type program, again, you don't really need the in-person environment and it's useful to have a video as a, a good option, maybe even the first choice. Zoom does not work well, I think, for medium-sized gatherings and uh, both pubs uh, or those sorts of gatherings of friends and uh, community level religious institutions have suffered greatly from not being able to have that sort of human interaction. So um, what we will need to go back to when this is all over uh, is some form of engagement, both religious and non-religious, where people from the community can get together, um, whether that will be more in pubs or in churches, <laughs> as maybe uh, not for me to say, um, but I think both are looking forward to the time when that's possible. I, I think both will in their own way, but again, the global, so local churches in local areas and local pubs in local areas, because people aren't necessarily going to go straight back to the traveling and on the road again, so both. I think it's the, the small will be okay in churches and possibly in the pubs local. I think the larger, bigger hub churches might be, the in-betweens might struggle at sort of mid-size a bit like David was saying about Zoom. So people want to go local again. And I think for many, so if you're not on the road in the same way, you're not commuting in and out to London or traveling on the road. And, and I don't think people are necessarily wanting to rush back to that. The local pub and the local church might both come out okay from that. I think the church will in the long term be okay and will survive, but we will see absolutely the stories of some decline of both pubs and churches in the interim. It's the trends underneath that that interest me, I suppose. And one final question then, just before we wrap up, we're, I mean, we're a year into COVID-19. Uh, we're cr closing in on the year, on a year since the first lockdown. Um, as people have said before, you know, religious believers are fatigued with Zoom and they're ground down by the constant changes like we all are. Does the panel have any advice or tips or kind of practical things about how religious leaders could kind of G up a flagging congregation for this final this final few months before, God willing, the vaccines start to, to take effect? How can we keep people engaged if the if the end is in sight, but we're, you know, they're incredibly weary after almost 12 months of slog? There's obviously fatigue. And I think what we are looking forward to is Ramadan, which is coming, um, which is going to start in April. And so it's just keeping keeping the momentum going and saying to people, look, how can we make uh, how can we make our mosque more hybrid? I think going forward uh, in the post COVID era, you know, it's going to be a mixture of both uh, online service as well as some physical activity in the mosque. And for Muslims, um, if I may just uh, split the service up into two parts, one is the actual prayer the movement the synchronization of movement that cannot happen online so you know that that has to have a physical presence uh, so for that reason i think people will remain connected to mosques whether they are partially open or however uh, you know they're open uh, but the uh, the sermon the services or the ancillary elements they will carry on online and so we you're just keeping, you know, end is at site on site, effectively saying that you know, vaccine is here. Let's hope and pray that we are granted relief from this pandemic as soon as possible. I think a lot of religions have a theology or thinking around suffering and difficulty and persecution and tough times. Uh, most have a kind of tell us an end, a hope, and certainly that's something that church leaders are talking about in the context that we're in. That we are hope carriers. There is hope. We think the, the vaccine's a part of that. So practically, there's a lot of work being done as to how can all religious bodies help with the information around that and getting people to vaccines. So there's a very practical part, which is really, uh, I think, useful. Th these are hard to reach. People are often connected to religious organizations, elderly people with lack of transport, et cetera. So it's a practical aspect. Uh, and then I do think the church calendar and religious calendars more generally, uh, as I think it was Tyler Cochrane was talking about, festivals and events that are coming up, Easter's next in the Christian calendar. There are obvious points where we, we signpost and move towards to say, this is where our hope is found. It's beyond this moment, but it may well work in tandem with and take us through the cycles. There are ups and downs. It's not a simple, let's look for the next happy point. Joy is found in something deeper. And I think uh, religions help point to that and move us through difficult and dark times, which is what we're in right now. 
Well, that seems like an appropriately cheery thought to end on, at least after what's been a slightly bleak conversation. But I'm really grateful for all of our for our guests, Peter, David, Kari and Tilak. Thanks so much for joining us, for sharing your expertise and your thoughts. Um, and thank you to everyone else uh, who's taken part and chipped in questions and, and watched along silently. We appreciate that. Um, keep an eye out if you want to watch back. This, this has been recorded. It will go on YouTube on the Religion Media Center's YouTube account shortly. Um, and please do visit our website, religionmediacenter.org.uk, for more details about upcoming Zoom conversations and a steady stream of fact sheets, news analysis, comment, and, and much, much more. Um, and I hope you see you uh, next week for our, for our next discussion. Thanks very much for taking part.